This is another internal seminar given by Fox Latin. We all know him. He studied mathematics uh, at the undergraduate and graduate level at the University of Kiel in Staffordshire and graduated with first class honours. He then moved to do his PhD at Nottingham University in applied mathematics. And in 2022, he started the, uh, at the School of Mathematics teaching various undergraduate courses. His research interests lie in wave dynamics and geometric ray theory, and he's also interested in mathematics education, focusing on curriculum design and participation in higher education mathematics. He won two consecutive prestigio prestigious annual awards for excellence in teaching and learning from the University of Nottingham. But today he's going to talk to us about asymptotic expansion of the Helmholtz and Maxwell equation. The floor is yours. Thank you, Alberto. I mean, what actually happened is Alberto says, Oh, I need someone to fill a gap, but you do it because you're cheap. I don't have to buy you lunch or anything. <laughs> and then he says, well, I'll buy you a beer. I said, I don't like beer. He says, oh, you're even cheaper then. <laughs> OK, yeah, so as Alberto said, this is uh, what I'm talking about today is an area of research I've done. I mean, I mean, this is kind of like an introduction to what it is for my PhD. OK, so it's all about <coughs> looking at the geometric relation between uh, rays and waves. OK, so what some people may not know is what an array is. So consider two points, say P and Q. If P is some kind of, say, light source and Q is a receiver, a, a, a sun, a person, whatever, then of course there are infinitely many ways we can connect these points. We can go like a straight line or we can go around or there are many that we can do and so on. Well, Fermat said that array is necessarily the path along which light travels in the shortest time. OK, so array to get from P to Q would be in the shortest time. So if the medium is homogeneous, for example, that would necessarily be a straight line because the whole wave speed within the medium would be identical everywhere. So of course, there to minimize the time, you'd minimize the distance. So what are the relations between rays and waves? Well, Consider a series of waves like this. The rays are geometrically, the rays are perpendicular to a wave front. So like this. I mean, you can, we can think of rays and waves as being like cars and roads. OK, so the, the waves travel along the rays. If you know the geometry of one, you can work out the other. So, for example, if we have, say, a point source like this and waves emanating radially from this, then the rays would be straight lines. If you've got a series of straight lines, the rays, then you know that you're going to have a series of plane waves. So, geometric theories. There's the geometric theory of acoustics and optics. Uh, these are uh, asymptotic approximations based on small scale if the waves of the width of the waves are small in relation to all other scales in the problem that you're dealing with and the idea is that the amplitude of a wave over its length would be changed minimally and the general form of this would be to take so if phi is our wave function we take an amplitude and an exponent of a term typically in physical terms we think of this as an amplitude in the phase so geometrically we've got the method of ray tracing so what this means is we look at the geometry of what we're dealing with to try and work out the dynamics of any given wave field so for example a point the phase is the point q would be equal to the phase at the point P plus the distance we travel to it. This is a homogeneous medium. I'll get to homogene in homogeneous in a second. What about the amplitude? OK, so if I've got two points here, P and Q, and they're separated two or apart, then I know that the phase at this point Q is the phase at P plus the distance we use to travel along. Consider a small tube of rays that pass through the points P and Q. Well, we can use this to work out what the amplitude of this 
uh, will be at any point. So again, sticking with P and Q. If the cross sectional area of this tube at P is, say, D sigma P, and likewise at point is D sigma Q, and the flux through this point will be proportional to this quantity. Okay, the square of the amplitude times the cross sectional area. And likewise, the flux through point Q will be something similar. So what we can do is just equate these and say these are equal because the energy is conserved as we pass through one point to another. <coughs> so we can then solve for the amplitude at point Q in terms of the values at point P. And now we've got all the information that we would need to find out the dynamics of the wave field at point Q. But we can go a step further, we can actually work out what this is. So if the geometry of the wavefront passing through here has two principal radius of curvature, radii of curvature, uh, which are called row one and row two, then as these are straight lines, this quantity becomes simply this. And so now we've got everything we need to determine the wave field at the second point. So that's the amplitude at the point Q. And if we multiply the exponent of this term, we've got the phase at point Q as well. Okay. Can you say again what are row one and row two? Yeah, so row one and row two, that's the, so it, the, the wave from that passes through this point P has, so in 3D, it's going to be a surface that passes through. Row one and row two represent the radii of curvature of the wavefront. And then as it passes through point Q, it will take a similar form because the rays are necessarily straight lines. A similar argument holds that the medium is inhomogeneous. So here we start off with the phase at the point Q is the phase at point P, but now because it's not necessarily a straight line we travel along, it will be a line integral over the refractive index. Uh, we can construct a similar sort of geometric argument. So here I've got a point P and a point Q, and I've got some cross-sectional areas in a small tube of rays. Can we have the same argument? I know that the flux through point P is the same as the flux through point Q. They're both proportional to each other, and therefore I can solve this for the amplitude at point Q. And then multiply that through by then that one that now I've got all this stuff that I need to construct a solution for the wave field at point Q. I've got the amplitude, which I've known from this, and my exponent term. I can't necessarily simplify this any further without knowing how the medium in homogeneity changes. I mean, when it's straight lines, if it's homogeneous, it's straight lines, it's simple to do. But not in this case, because of course it will vary depending on how the in homogeneity varies. Which is why the refractive index is still appearing in there. So, I mean, some practical applications of this that we can see are all around. So, we, you know, we've got some uh, acoustics in architectural design, especially if you're trying to design a lecture theatre, for example. Uh, imaging in well, MRI scans, for example. Uh, optical theories. Uh, a more accessible one is reflection and refraction from runner. Okay, which probably I imagine most of us in this room have seen. So, if you've got a in a very simple case, suppose you've got something like a flat plane. I have an incident field encroaching upon this surface. I'll have a reflected rays coming away from this. And depending on if the well, what, what type of surface this is, I may have a refracted ray as well. Now, this type of thing isn't new. I mean, these observations have gone back to well, many hundreds of years ago, thousands of years necessarily. I mean, there's mentions of this in the library at Alexandria. 
which we know all about thanks to Mark last time. So let's look at it. Well, that's the geometric theory. We can also approach this from an analytic perspective. Now, this is where I come in. The main problem with this is what people did before is it requires knowing the geometries of wave fronts. So let's look at this from a analytic perspective. The wave equation. OK, we, we've all seen this before, I imagine. Well, if I take a time harmonic series, so a separable solution, so some function in terms of space and another one in terms of time, something which is oscillatory, then when I get out, the, the wave equation becomes the Helmholtz equation. So this, we may solve this. Well, there's two areas of two regimes of interest. OK, we've got k goes to zero, in which case the Helmholtz equation is regularly perturbed, or we have the opposite, where k is large, in which case we have a singularly perturbed problem. This is why I focus on the singularly perturbed problem. So the analysis, the WKBJ analysis, says well, what we can do, we can assume phi has some amplitude function and an exponent term. Now, what we would expect is that this S is at most order K, because that way, when we substitute into the Helmholtz equation, we have some balancing terms. <coughs> Otherwise, well, if that didn't happen, then the whole thing could just reduce to zero. So if we do that, what we then get is this coupled equation for the amplitude and for the phase terms. This is still exact, OK? This is just this substituted into the Helmholtz equation. No more. And the idea now is to say, well, I, I want to solve this. Uh, K is large. So of course, what we'd expect is that this delta S here would have a K term at most, OK? Because that way, we have something to balance with. Sure, yeah, go ahead. So what is the physical meaning of the two limits? K going to zero and K going to infinity? Uh, that would be the short and long wave, or rather the long and the short wavelength, respectively. So the, yeah, so the, the geometric theories that people were working on before are the short waves, okay? So this, this K goes to infinity would be analogous to that, but obtained from a, an uh, analytic perspective rather than uh, the k goes to zero, which is the long wave limit. And regarding the Helmholtz decomposition, you're, you're decomposing to the solenoidal and uh, yeah. when you're writing Helmholtz decomposition, what, what do you mean? Exactly? Okay, all, of, all I mean by that is I've taken my WKBJ expansion and I've put in it directly into the Helmholtz equation. Okay. Sorry. And then from that, yeah, so this this is why we would expect this S to have uh, a K term, because when we take the, loosely speaking, when we take the second derivative of the exponent term, that would then balance with this K squared term. Yeah, I, about square, but it, it seems A is missing as a factor. No? And there? Yeah, <coughs> just in front of it. No? No, you're right. OK, A. <laughs> yeah, hey, this is what happens when the organizer calls you cheap. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, you're absolutely right. Yeah, this would be an A. There was an A factor in there. Well spotted. That's a good eye for detail. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. It's real and is A complex. Interesting. Right. So you they can be both can be complex. Okay. I'm restricting the analysis to a real amplitude and a real phase term so that when it is imaginary, sorry, so that when it is multiplied by i, it becomes imaginary and it is a phase term. But you can, yeah, there is such a thing as complex ray theory, but I'm not going to go into that today. Uh, but no, you, you, you're right. I'll, I'll pick up on that again when we get a bit further on. 
But yeah, so A and S are real valued. Uh, OK, so we also need a requirement for an expansion in A. So the best thing we can do with that is have it ascending in powers of k to the negative n. So k to the zero, k to the negative one, and so on. And what happens if we do this? Well, here, there is no a term, so we can decouple our equations. And what we get is we get that v1, this space term, this comes in order k, is, satisfies this. It's, it's called the iconal equation. Second order, sorry, second degree, first order partial differential equation. Then the transport equations for the ANs satisfy a series of equations. Well, this, this kick starts for A0. The, the higher order terms look very similar. Okay. So, of course, what we need to do is work out the solution to V1 and then this feeds into the rest of them. This, of course, these, these are linear in A, N. But the problem lies in this being strongly nonlinear. So the first thing we need to do is try and solve this, OK? So we use a method of characteristic theory. So suppose I need to solve that in this domain D. So I'm solving the iconal equation in domain D. I need to introduce a new characteristic coordinate system. So take this point X here. Right? In this characteristic coordinate system, or rather in the Cartesians, if I need to get to X, I come along by X and then I go up by Y. Okay. In the characteristic theory, I'll, what I will do is I'll go along the boundary to a point S and then I'll travel along the associated characteristic by point tall. Uh, this is in 2D, just to make it easier to visualize. So in 2D, what we'll have is dv1 squared, dv1 dx squared plus dv1 dy squared. If I introduce some simplifications, I'll call them p and q, then what I have is p squared and q squared is equal to 1. I may differentiate this with respect to, say, x. And then I note that this is no longer fully nonlinear, it's now quasi linear. So, what I can say is that p will be constant in any direction pq. Then, according to characteristic theory, what I can do is say that, well, along this curve, I will define dx detour to be the coefficient of this p, which is there, and dy detour will be the coefficient of the dp dy, which is q. So if I do that, I then find that this equation that we obtained just becomes the ordinary derivative along this curve of v1. So v1 is constant along this curve. So I can write a solution by saying V1 in the characteristic coordinate system is whatever value it takes here plus the distance we went along. And this agrees with the geometric theories that we were looking at at the beginning. But now what we can do is we can actually find a relation between this Cartesian frame and this characteristic frame. <coughs> well, I know here P is constant along this characteristic curve. So I may just integrate P. I know that P is dx detour. So if I integrate directly, what I find is that x, the x coordinate over here, is our x coordinate plus tor in the direction that we're facing to get to the characteristic. And likewise, I can just integrate y and I get a similar looking equation. And that's it. The only thing we need to do now is what we've done. We've introduced two new variables, P, P naught and Q naught. So how do we solve for those? Well, 
what we can do is we can use the chain rule and say that if I know what the boundary data is, I can differentiate with respect to the boundary parameter. And I get one equation. But I also know that P squared and Q squared sum to make one. Well, if that's true, it's true everywhere. It's also true on the boundary. So I get another equation and I know that that's equal to one from that kernel equation itself. And then I can solve these. And I get a solution in terms of the tangential and normal vectors to the boundary. So now what we've done, we've, we've found a solution to the phase term. But in terms of our new ray coordinate system, without knowing exactly what it is, we can't revert back, but we've now got it. We've got the solution. We've got in the directions valid. And then these just supplement this to give us what the P naught and the Q naught are. So now what we may do is actually look at the transport equation for the amplitude. So within the same frame, we're still solving this in this frame. This was the transport equation for the leading order amplitude term. Well, because of the way we define this, this here becomes the ordinary derivative along the characteristic curve. So what we get is something that we get a nice linear, or in this case separable, ODE for the amplitude, which we can then solve by introducing an integrating factor. So if this A0 is the boundary value for the amplitude term, and then this AS is some collection of terms to represent some properties of the boundary. So for example, if this happened to be a wavefront boundary, then this AS would become the radius of curvature of the boundary. And that, that brings to a close the classic theory, at least to leading order. I mean, now that we know this, we could calculate higher order amplitudes because we have a recurrence relation. Just to put it in perspective, here's a typical problem. I've got some arbitrary boundary. I've got which in comparison to the wavelength is order one. I've got an incident field which we would assume to be known. And we want to calculate the dynamics of this reflector field. Well, the whole field in this region satisfies the Helmholtz equation. But the whole field is the summation of the incident fields and the reflector field. So we look at the incident field and we know that, well, that will satisfy the Helmholtz equation because, but very, very loosely speaking, if there's no boundary, then the whole field is just the incident field. So this will satisfy the Helmholtz equation automatically. So we may assume that the incident field's leading order takes some, some amplitude term and some phase term. And then because, because of the homogeneity property of the Helmholtz equation, and the incident field satisfies the Helmholtz equation, the reflective field will also satisfy the Helmholtz equation. So what we can do now is assume that the solution to this will take some unknown, well, take some form like this, what we've just been looking at. So then what we can do is say, right, well, on the surface of where these two waves meet, the fields must be proportional. So we may compare the exponents. So I know that the reflected phase on the border is equal to the incident phase. And then I can then use the solution to the trans at the Lyakonal equation and say that the solution to the phase will be this value plus however long we are along the characteristic. I also know that the amplitudes will be proportional to each other depending on the nature of the boundary. So if we impose a boundary condition, I, I use this just to incorporate uh, many possibilities. So I've got an alpha, which is a constant, 
uh, it's multiplied by a k because when we take the normal derivative of phi, we'd have a k coming out from the exponent. So I can use this to solve our amplitude equation. And I got something that looks like this in complete generality. And now I've got all the ingredients I need to solve for the reflected wave field at any given point. So as a brief example, if we look at the incident plane wave, then the incoming field takes the recognizable form of some function of the single variable this, and it's got a phase which is with respect to an angle of incidence, and this is coming downwards, hence the minus and the y. So I know that on the on the border, uh, and then I motivate that the reflective field will also take this form. So on the border, these things will look similar; they will behave in proportional to each other. So now I have the series of equations, which says I know that this will be proportional to the boundary equation. So what I get is the phase of the reflective waves is equal to, at anywhere away from the boundary, is equal to the boundary data for the incident field, plus however far along we are from the boundary. And I can also solve for the amplitude equation to get a leading over term. And now I've got everything that I'd need to construct the reflected field anywhere away from the border. The limitation of classic analysis is that it doesn't account for all types of wave phenomena. So take, for example, diffraction. According to the classic theory, what we would expect is, here's a prism, I have a ray of light going into it, we would expect it to refract with inside the prism and then refract again as it comes outside and go like that. But this type of phenomena doesn't happen. Not like this anyway. What happens is we'll have a beam of light coming in, break up inside the prism, and then coming out will be a broken down version of the light. It breaks down into its its components. And of course, this is seen in many places. Rainbow is for someone earlier when it was raining, right? This is just a nice picture, but what I wanted to do is illustrate the idea of diffraction. So this is diffraction by tangent rays. Suppose you've got a some kind of body there. I've got a light source at point P, which is on one side, and it emits out light radially. What you would expect, everything behind there would be dark because no light can penetrate this body. But this contradicts things that we've seen all around us. Okay. What actually happens, light does reach into this region, it's still the shadow zone. So if you have a point in there, which Q, light will reach that point Q by two distinct routes. What happens is the light will come along here, it will approach tangentially to the diffractor, it will travel along, sort of bending around the object, and then emit out two rays, one from there and one from down there. And then these travel tangentially to this point, and this is the region. This is why the shadow region actually has some light in it, because the light breaks up and still penetrates into this dark zone. A single incident ray will give rise to many, well, infinitely many, uh, diffracted rays. So take, just as an example, this fits all as a circle, and I have an incident ray coming in. What happens is I get a diffracted ray coming up, which is what we'd expect. The rest of the energy travels around the border, slight amount, and well, an infinitesimal amount, and then emits from there another diffracted ray tangentially. And then the rest of the energy will travel around even further and emit another ray, and so on, and so on. So a single incident ray will give rise to infinitely many diffracted rays. A 
A property of these rays, these, these diffracted rays, well, far, far away from the diffractor, they act like any ordinary ray with a crucial difference. They don't just have a single exponent term, they've got multiple exponent terms. So in a case like this, for example, these rays will have a phase term, one that's proportional to K, like in the classic analysis, but diffracted rays tend also to have a diffract, a phase term which is proportional to K to the negative one third. And that doesn't agree with classic analysis. So in the 1950s, two people, Friedlander and, and Keller, decided to try and analyze this in a generic, more generic way to accommodate the individual results obtained by various authors. So they said, right, what we'll do, we'll still continue with the WJBK analysis, but now this S will incorporate an additional term to try and accommodate all of this diffraction theory that people have noticed. And therefore, the amplitude will have a, a suitable expansion depending on this alpha. So take the same approach. We substitute these into the Helmholtz equation. And what, what they found very quickly was alpha must satisfy this region. Because if alpha is greater than one, then essentially the V2 term becomes constant. So what you do there is just amalgamate the exponential of that term into the amplitude function, and you get something which is not that different to the classic analysis. It's, it's well, in terms of uh, the functionality, it's identical. If, if this alpha is negative, what would happen then is the exponential of this k to the alpha would decrease in powers of k. So again, you could just amalgamate that into the amplitude expansion. Uh, of course, if alpha is 1, then these are the same value. So what was B1 is now B1 plus B2. So alpha that's between 0 and 1. But actually, if you go to not first order, but third order in the balancing of the Helmholtz equation, you get the same result if alpha is greater than a half. That V2 would be constant. So the viable range is that if alpha satisfies this range. Well, then the leading order term in the Helmholtz decomposition tells us that V1 still satisfies the Arcanon equation, V2 and V1 are related, and the amplitude equation, if alpha is less than a half, is identical to the classic analysis. If alpha is equal to one half exactly, then we get this additional term coming in here. So we can go through the same method and solve this analytically, which is get, we get this solution for alpha being less than a half. But then if alpha is one half, we get this additional exponent term. The crucial thing here is that we get an i. So although to leading order, the amplitude is indifferent, it does now contain a change, an order one change to the phase term. So, Uh, okay, so think about the problem we looked at before, right? Where we had some board, some boundary that looked like this. Suppose now this isn't a boundary; it's an underlying profile, but now it looks something like this. And the size of these undulations is order k to the negative half. Okay. In a, to put it in perspective, like, you know, imagine you've got a flat plane, that would be the, the order one case, the classic analysis, like a table, for example. But then what might happen is the table might have a profile, which is rather than being z equals zero, it might be something like k to the negative half f of x and y. So there's some length scale imposed on this boundary, which is a fractional power, in this case, k to the negative half, of the wave number. Well, all the observations we made before remain. The total field up here, if you have an incident field and a reflected field, 
the whole field to satisfy the, uh, the Helmholtz equation. So you'd assume that the incident field has this expansion, but on the on this the real boundary here, this one, what happens is if you take a Taylor expansion of the U function, you're going to get a term which is proportional to k to the half. And therefore, because the phases must match on, on the border, that motivates that the reflected field away from it will also take this form. But according to classic theory, this V2 wouldn't exist. And you think, okay, well, that's all very well and good, but what, what if this wasn't k to the minus a half? What if it's k to the minus third or k to the any proper fraction? What would you do then? Because then what would happen is if it wasn't k to the half, if it was k to the third, for example, and k to the negative third, like with the diffraction problems, then this analysis would also say that we relax to the classic analysis. So it's a bit of a dilemma, but then you start to think, well, actually, maybe Friedlander and Keller's results were, maybe the half isn't the special case. Maybe the half is a direct consequence of only including one additional term. So you could think, right, okay, so what if you now decide to have three terms? So you'd have something like uh, I k v1 plus I k to the alpha v2 plus I k to the alpha v3 in your exponent. What happens then? Well, you can proceed through a very similar analysis like they did. And what we find is, well, alpha and beta would have to be in the same range, zero to a half. No, zero to one. They can't be outside of one because otherwise these additional terms become zero. They can't be less than one because then the exponent of these terms is just, you can amalgamate that into the amplitude profile. So you can proceed through the derivation and what you actually find is, well, the only thing that makes a sense to balance this is if this alpha is two thirds, and this beta would be one third. And it, again, the same analysis applies. You could have a k to the four times uh, k to the gamma times v four, and so on. But in that case, what you'd find is that the expansion would be going down in quarters, so one three quarter half and a quarter. So this motivates the idea of a generalized expansion. If you've got a wave phenomena with fractional power in the exponent, then the solution must take a generalized form. So again, we stick with this type of expansion, but now what we have is this in the exponent. So we have a k times v1 plus and then a k to the n minus one over there, v2 and so on, down to k to the one on n, vn. And therefore, a suitable expansion for the amplitude will also descend in powers of small n. And for the same reasons we talked about, these terms over here wouldn't be more than one. K wouldn't be more than one, wouldn't be less than zero. So that's why we fix it in this range. If we put this into the Helmholtz equation, V1 still satisfies the iconal equation. We get a series of equations for the remaining terms. And we get something that looks like this for the leading order amplitude. In the classic case, this is not there. So this change appears here. So this would be the classic solution, but now we'd also have this exponent with an I in front. So this change is the canonical change imposed by having an additional set of terms in the expansion. So what we may do there in this case is if you had a problem that looked like this, if this wasn't necessarily key to the negative half, if it was anything, what we would do is we would assume that 
the incident field would take its classic form. The reflected field would take its generalized form. And we would take a Taylor expansion of the incident field and the reflected field on the boundary. And that would give us the various boundary sets of data. And we can then solve that to get a solution. That's one application. Another one would be, say, wave propagation through an inhomogeneous medium. Take, for example, if a wave bearing media is weakly stratified. So something like the atmosphere. Because what would happen there is you'd have additional terms in the exponents, but there'd be nothing to balance them with unless you considered them in their derivative terms, in which case you'd have to take a generalized expansion. OK, so for instance, if I had, say, say you had a medium and the refractive index was something like 1 plus n naught times k to the negative half. Then according to the classic theory, what would happen is the exponent would be an integral of this term. But if we assume a solution that breaks down according to this generalized theory, then what we get is a series of what we have is essentially something which will incorporate this term. So we'll have a k times the standard term, which is from the classic analysis, plus an i k to the half times our new term. And this will permit us to actually find a solution in close book form. Of course, this is not as useful when the medium is strongly stratified. But it is more at that point, a more valid way, a more accessible way to find a solution. Show me. Where's the rest? Let's see the last one. Is it the last one? Oh, it's coming close to time anyway. Yeah, it's the last one. Damn, it was my last slide. I blame LaTeX. Okay. Um, Since it's close to time, I may as well open this floor to any questions. I appreciate that the end was a little bit abrupt. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, granted, this was quite dense. It was all theory based. But yeah, please ask questions. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I tried. Well, what I wanted to do is make this more accessible. So what we could do, the idea there is what we're trying to do is find solutions to the governing equations in this regime in a more generalized way. So what a lot of authors have done have, is that they've solved particular problems such as tangent diffraction or edge diffraction or uh, things like that. So the tangential ray diffraction is quite interesting because if you have a circle uh, or any tangent ray, you have an incident ray coming in, what happens is 
this is one diffracted ray. Here, you get a, a region which is k to the negative half. Uh, you get another region of a solution where you have to solve again. Then this region is k to the negative third. And far away, far away from these, these rays are like any other. They behave like every other ray. Uh, the only time this isn't valid is only at the point of diffraction. That's uh, what we call the caustic. That's uh, where the amplitude analytically blows up. But I mean, it doesn't in reality, but that's what the amplitude uh, equations tell us. So yeah, what's, what, what many authors have done is they've solved this in a region, say in this region, which is k to the negative half. They then solved it in a, a larger region and then matched the two asymptotically along with any kind of boundary layer that may be imposed or, or may happen and then found solutions to leading order from that kind of balancing. Whereas in this instance, what we're trying to do is just generalize this and say, well, what you could do is if you've got a, uh, a k to the negative half region and a k to the negative third region, then you may, well, what you can do is take, in this instance, a fractional order of a sixth, and that will, that will accommodate both ranges. Another example is uh, a geometric. Uh, imagine it's a, bit, it's a bit like a wing, uh, and you have some tip diffraction coming in at the edge. Well, the local profile of this must be something like y is k to the negative half. In the rest of the region, it's fine because they come off and, and just reflect back down. Uh, but at these tips, the local scalings that you'd have to impose on the region would be uh, k to the negative half. So there's a certain amount of geometric uh, interpretation and ge uh, cause for what this work. I appreciate that a bit of a tangent, but it's a way to win last. Can I just ask? Yeah, sure. You mentioned acoustics. So, acoustics are where the uh, um, rays they meet into a point? Yeah, so that's, uh, I mean, in the language of the characteristic theory, that would be where you have characteristic crossing. Uh, I mean, from a from a geometric interpretation uh, in the language of diffraction, what happens there is the, at the point of diffraction, the solution tends to infinity as you get closer to a caustic. So uh, there's a whole different theory arranging for uh, caustic areas. It's a bit like these uh, surface waves. So I showed, you know, roughly speaking, something will go along like this and then it'll travel around and then leave on a diffracted ray. This, uh, so the acoustic here would be at the start of this diffracted ray. But away from here, the diffracted ray behaves like, like all others. Okay, so if Sasha has a question, a quick one before all the pure yeah, mathematicians still have our biscuits. That's, uh, I could be That's the most important thing. I could go, uh, as, I, as far as I remember, in the after for the seminar, it was mentioned also maximum equation. Ah, uh, yeah. So, what the beauty there is, of course, so under certain conditions, Maxwell's equations can relax to a vectorial form of Helmholtz equations. Uh, I mean, I'll sort of spoil the punchline here. Um, if you consider Maxwell's equations in their raw form, then the transport equations you get are essentially the same as what I've got here, but with another line. I mean, so we need to invite you back for a chapter two of the presentation. Two of the presentation. <laughs> yeah, good luck. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, so. Yeah, Maxwell's equations, it, right, so the rays, geometrically, the rays don't care what kind of waves they're supporting. Uh, acoustic, uh, well, as long as they're linear, uh, acoustic, electromagnetic, uh, it doesn't matter, right? What they're, what they're interested in is how they move 
gone further on. So take, for example, another angle to your question. If you had the refraction phenomena, so that's coming in, that's going out. These rays are these rays, regardless of whether or not there's a, a refracted field. Okay, or you know, even even an evanescent field. These rays are these rays, and they don't care about what happens. You know, likewise, similarly, these rays are not impacted by, and that is it's the geometry of what's going on, rather than particular types of wave analysis. Okay, so uh, another thing that I also looked at was uh, Navier's equations of elasticity. And you find, but surprisingly, they satisfy the same thing. Things start changing as the media changes from homogeneous to inhomogeneous. So, for example, uh, Maxwell's equations in an inhomogeneous media, you can't, they can't relax to Harmon's equation in, in an inhomogeneous media. So, there, the transport equations change. And in their raw form, they do incorporate a bunch of other terms depending on the permeability and per, 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 permittivity of the medium. Uh, and so it's, 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 it's like a Navier's equations of elasticity as well. Mm. There you go. It's interesting that uh, right. for water waves, uh, as you said, that uh, water wave equations, uh, they are relaxed <laughs> to that uh, ratio for long waves. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. long waves. So what the, Finally, you still can use that short wave theory <laughs> for long waves. Well, the beauty about the geometric theory that was derived, you know, many decades ago, was although it's motivated by short wave analysis, its applications in well, medium wave, if you like, is still is, is very good. And it's only when the length scale of the wave starts to approach the length scale, all the length scales in the problem, that it starts to have more of an error. But it's still, yeah, it, it's, it's very accurate, even for an asymptotic theory. Probably why, as you say, it's a short wave analysis could work uh, as an estimate for the, the long wave theory. Of course, you know, from a, a purely mathematical perspective, the short wave analysis is more interesting because it's singular to perturbs. Okay, I think, uh... We ask enough questions for the moment being. There are people left lining up outside the door. And so <laughs> it's time to thank our speaker. Thank you. And uh, have uh, some tea biscuits in S120.